Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 13 of What If Deku Had a Precognition Quirk. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 14 of it, comment down below and let me know. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Your hero name is Deku, correct? What inspired that name? Izuku gave the camera a warm smile. It's a nickname from when I was in middle school. One of my best friends came up with it. The reporter nodded thoughtfully. Sounds like you can do it short and to roll off the tongue. Izuku shrugged and went with it. I always wanted to be a hero ever since I was a kid. All Might was my favorite, but I'm a fan of all the others as well. What kind of hero do you want to be? The kind that shows the world that anyone can be a hero. It's not easy being a hero, the reporter warned, mainly for the benefit of the audience. It's dangerous, between villains and natural disasters, and it's a lot of responsibility. Izuku nodded. Very true, but it's not something that can be overcome by working hard enough. Having a good quirk for the job also helps. Speaking of, what is your quirk, exactly? To our knowledge, you haven't shown it in the preliminary rounds. Are you leaving it as an ace in the hole for the round robin finals? My quirk? Izuku asked innocently. He had gone over exactly how he wanted to respond to this with the Goimato. His business partner had argued for being straight with it, for leveraging his disability as much as possible. Izuku, however, had seen himself doing otherwise. Izuku wriggled his leg out of his costume, no mean feat since his entire leg was wrapped in metal framework. Once he had his boot off, he took off his sock and wriggled his toes on live camera. I have an extra joint in my pinky toes, he said. The reporter blinked, then comprehension hit him like a hammer. You corkless, he blurted out. Got diagnosed when I was five. Technically not a lie, which made Izuku feel better about deceiving the entire nation. With a dry chuckle, Izuku said, when that happened, I thought I would never be a hero, but, well, here I am. To the reporter's credit, he recovered quickly from his shock. So, when you say anyone can do it, I mean anyone. It's not the cork or the costume that makes a hero. It's the person underneath. The reporter flipped through his notes. We've done some research, and there's rumors that an artist known as Deku is a hero student as well. There's a lot of speculation that it's you. It's true. The reporter looked as though he wanted to ask more, but the countdown of a timer stopped him short. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for now, but who knows. Maybe we'll have another interview after the festival's over. Izuku shook hands with the reporter and left. On his way out to the festival, he passed Odoroki. He paused to the side, clearly inviting Izuku to stop next to him. I'm not going to go easy on you next round. If you really mean that, Izuku countered, you should use your fire. Todoroki looked as though he had been slapped. Izuku felt a twinge of guilt, but like any other time, he forced it down, and reminded himself it was all necessary. Deku being introduced on live television turned a lot of heads on the festival grounds. Students, heroes, and spectators alike stopped in their tracks to watch the first interview. Tashinori felt Inko's hand tense up in his, and it only then just hit him that they had been holding hands all the way down the elevator. Is everything okay? Tashinori asked. Inko started and looked up at him. Her eyes darted down to their hands, and Tashinori almost let go, but she only held on tighter. I, I'm fine. Just a little nervous, I guess. With a nervous chuckle, she added, not every day that your son has a live interview. For a while, the interview went without incident, and the people returned to the festivities, keeping an ear cocked to the nearest speaker, and glancing at screens all the while. When Deku was asked about his quirk, however, everyone stopped in their tracks again. The crowd waited with bated breath and no small amount of confusion, as Deku wriggled out of his costume's metallic leg. When he had told the reporter about his extra toe joint, the crowd reacted with puzzled whispers. When the reporter said aloud that Deku was corkless, the whispers grew louder until the whole festival roiled with overlapping conversations. The general atmosphere ranged from excited to baffled, with enough outraged comments sprinkled into the crowd to make Toshinori clench his teeth. Having been corkless himself, hearing others with his condition mistreated had always been a sore spot of his. Toshinori looked back at Inko, and found her shrinking away from the crowd. He lightly squeezed her hand, making her look back at him, and asked, need to go somewhere else. No, no I'm fine, we're already halfway through the line. Their admission ticket covered the cost of the takoyaki, which was fortunate since Toshinori's wallet had also disappeared. The seats were cramped, but their takoyaki came speared with toothpicks, so they were able to walk around and eat at the same time. Toshinori would have hell to pay a few hours from now for his greasy indulgence, given his inability to digest anything that hadn't first gone through a centrifuge, but he considered the tangy, flavorful burst on his tongue with each mouthful well worth the price. Inko led the way through the festival to check out the carnival games and prizes, while Toshinori tagged along in silence. I can't remember the last time I went to one of these, she said. Toshinori almost missed her comment over the tumult of the festival. I don't think I've ever been to one. You haven't. How come? I don't know. 
I guess I've been too busy. Oh? Inko twirled a lock of hair around her finger. Tashinori felt himself grinning like a madman at the sight, and mentally scolded himself for being a creep. Well, why don't we play a few games? I mean, we have a lot of time before the festival starts up again, and if we just went back to our seats, there'd be nothing to do for a whole hour, and that would probably be a bit awkward. She started and frantically added, not that it'd be your fault, or anything, I'm just saying it would be nice to have something to do during that time. You unless you'd rather not, sitting and waiting is fine with me. How do we play? How? Inko had a confused look on her face until shock flashed across her features. Oh, right, you've never played before. I, uh, I can show you. Just, pick one and let's give it a try. Tashinori went up to the nearest empty stall. Its shoddy construction showed in bent nails, cracked boards, and a sloppy paint job, but the words ring tosses stood out in bright red letters. Behind the counter attended by a bored-looking teenager was a table covered with bottles, all different shapes and sizes. Each person gets six rings, the teen said. Some guy with 12 kids cleaned me out, so you won't get anything if you win. Tashinori accepted a handful of rings. At Inko's insistence, he lobbed one like a frisbee at the collection of bottles. The ring clattered off the glass tops and fell onto the table. The remaining five all bounced between the bottles without finding their target. Better luck next time, the teen drawled. What about you, ma'am? Inko straightened her shirt and said, yes, I'll try it as well. Their first five tries also went wide, with one missing the bottles entirely. Before her sixth try, Inko asked, do you mind if I try using my quirk? The teen raised an eyebrow. You aren't supposed to, but there's no prizes left, so who cares? The teen leaned forward attentively as Inko prepared her final throw. Tashinori also felt himself eagerly awaiting the use of her quirk. Their toss went high and far, floating well above the table. Tashinori thought it was going to hit the far wall until it seemed to lazily drift back. As it flew, the ring angled itself to catch on a glass rim. It swung around the neck of the bottle a few times, and came to a sudden stop. Telekinesis quirk of some kind, the teen asked. I can pull objects towards myself, Inko explained. I used to be better at that trick. You purposely overshot the bottle so you could correct its course with your quirk, right? Tashinori asked. Inko smiled. It works best when I can start pulling on it right away. I used to get a lot of prizes, that way when I was a kid. Her smile slipped. I haven't used my quirk in ages. Was it because of your son? The words slipped out of him, before he could stop himself. I guess it was. Her voice grew faint, and took on a melancholic tone. It didn't feel right, using my quirk in front of him. It brought him to tears the first few times, but afterwards, even when I slipped up, he never reacted. After a while, I got used to not using it. It hurt too much. Every time, it reminded me of what he would be missing for his whole life, and how much it crushed him. His hand found hers of its own accord. He will be a hero someday. Even without a quirk, he made it all happen. His words brought tears to his eyes. Tashinori felt his heart drop through the pavement beneath his shoes. He had to do all that without my help. I never believed it was possible. I, I was scared he would try, and when I heard he applied to UA, I was praying they'd just put him in the general studies course. When I heard he got in, and with the top score on both tests, I couldn't believe it. I thought it had to be a mistake. Now, though, seeing what he can do, what he managed to do without my help, makes me wonder how much further he could have gone, if I had believed in him all these years. Gently, he wrapped both arms around her. Inko flinched at first, but she didn't pull away. You tried your best, Tashinori whispered. And you raised a fine young man. Maybe you weren't perfect, but nobody is. Inko hiccuped and sniffed. With a soft smile, she asked, not even all might. Tashinori felt his heart stop. From the uneasy expression on her face, she had to have noticed him tense up. No, he said, his voice hollow, not even all might. Yatsubashi lounged in a conference room, repurposed for MLA meeting. On one screen, the UA students gave their live interviews, punctuated with commercial breaks. On the others, a news station discussed everything they knew about the quirkless Deku, and Deku's Twitter feed panned through a long list of comments on his updated status as a quirkless hero in training. We should have done it sooner, one of Yatsubashi's lieutenants said. Letting that quirkless vermin get this far will encourage harsher regulations on quirks. I can already hear the pithy speeches about how quirks aren't needed to make a difference in the world. Yatsubashi swirled around a glass of sake. Patience. The higher he rises, the harder he will fall. Besides, the only way to guarantee Midoriya's death is in single combat. The man crossed his arms. I still think it was too risky. Well, they both made it, a woman across from him said, so why complain about it? Besides, it's not like the brat's going to win, right? Not with Endeavor's son in the mix. I don't care how good that gear is, nothing can stand against a perfect quirk like that. Yatsubashi decided not to point out that Todoroki's perfect quirk, according to the school's records, was only being half used. Even half a quirk beat none. It was simple math. Have they released a tournament schedule yet? Yatsubashi asked. No sir. Looks like they're waiting to randomize it once the interviews are over. A pity. 
Fukusabe-san, could you run a final diagnostic on that injector we added? You can't be too careful with Nezu sniffing around our contract work. The aforementioned engineer ran a program on his phone. The remote receiver is still responding. Like I said earlier, they have to completely disassemble the gauntlets to find the injector, and if they did that, they detonate the nitroglycerin pockets stored with the injector. There's no way of deactivating the device without setting off the explosive. And removing every trace of our tampering with no one the wiser another lieutenant finished. Your brilliance never ceases to amaze me, Rikiya-san. Yatsubashi smiled and hid his bitter grimace behind another sip of sake. That man had gotten too obsequious for his taste, perhaps an accident was in order, or a scandal of some kind. Did we dig anything up else on them? Yatsubashi asked. It's mostly circumstantial evidence we're finding, but there was a file written up by a teacher that had been terminated shortly after, that they had never fully deleted. The tech expert grinned. Juicy stuff, details about the burn marks and everything. I also managed to clip together some footage from traffic cams, a bit blurry, but presentable enough. Perfect. Have that ready to drop. We'll time it about an hour after his death is officially announced. As he poured himself another glass, Yotsubashi muse, it'll be the perfect story, the tragic tale of a quirkless student, who had gotten in over his head against a power-hungry, violent young hero, willing to do whatever it took to look good on television. Yuez. Reputation will be ruined, heroes will be restricted, and in the chaos to come, we can lobby hard for people to exercise the right to defend themselves. He raised his filled glass and called out, to our liberation. There's much work to be done afterwards, but today will mark a decisive blow for the MLA. Perhaps it was a premature toast, but his lieutenants, swept up by his sudden speech, all cheered with him, to our liberation. When the announcement showed the fated match, to be the very last of the festival, Yatsubashi knew it had to be an omen of good fortune for them. Chisaki Kai kept his spotless lab. Syringes, scalpels, refrigerators, centrifuges, an HPLC chromatograph, and more, meticulously arranged and disinfected three times before and after each use. The concrete floor and padded chair bore faint ridges, nearly invisible signs from hasty reassembly, after breaking their blood-sodden surfaces down to the molecular level. A sharp knock came at the door, and it flung open. A black-clad man wearing the bird mask of the Shi Hasekai barged into the room waving his cell phone. Hey boss, you got to see this. Overhaul stuck a syringe into Yuri's arm. She wince, but didn't make a sound as he drew another vial of blood. After setting the sample into a refrigerator, he washed his hands three times before turning to address his underling. I'm busy, Overhaul snapped. This better be important. The man's grin faltered, but he held up his phone. On it, a green-haired kid announced to the public that he didn't have a quirk. Some UA student competing this year is quirkless. I thought you would appreciate it, since, you know. Overhaul took the phone from him and listened to his speech. After it was finished, Overhaul reduced the phone to stray wisps of gaseous plastic and metal. The underling swallowed and anxiously watched Overhaul flex his hands. Even the healthy ones are diseased, Overhaul sneered. All the more reason to get rid of quirks and heroes forever. When he got back into the room, Iri had fallen off the chair. Her skin was turning gray, and her body was cold. With the lightest touch of his hand, her body burst apart in a shower of blood, and stitched itself back together into a living child. Iri trembled as he washed his hands again. That's enough for today. You've been a good girl, so you can have some extra food today. Iri nodded mutely, and ran out of the room. Once she was gone, Overhaul pulled the latest fruit of his efforts out of the incubator. The clear, viscous liquid, with the essence of Eri's quirk carefully measured and treated with his quirk, was the first step in ridding the world of heroes. He washed his hands three times, grimacing in distaste at the grimy grey powder coating his hands, and rubbed his hands with sanitizer three times for good measure. Everything in threes, a nice clean number. Balance. Pure. Just like he'd make the world. Going out the back door of his lab, he climbed down into the boss's hospital room. It had taken a great deal of threats and favors to convince the other members not to put him in a hospital. They might ruin something. Only he could put him back together exactly as he should be. One hand strayed to the unconscious man's wrist, and Chisaki stopped himself. Not now, not until the world was clean again and the Shi Hasekai were back in their rightful place. Not until he was the last diseased man on earth, with his remedy in hand. He would use it to fix one last mistake in the world, and get rid of it forever. It's nearly ready, he whispered excitedly. The effect is only temporary now, but it's marketable. The Shi Hasekai will be richer than ever. Then I can finish the final antidote. He put both hands on the bed, and knelt next to his mentor. We're so close to a perfect world. That's a bit more time, and you'll be able to see it. The comatose man in the hospital bed gave no reply. His vitals gave off a slow, steady beat, and each breath made the sheets rise and fall. Three connections in his brain were severed with precision that would leave neurosurgeons envious, preventing him from waking up. The lightest brush of his fingers would fix him, but Chisaki left his hands where they were. Once he returned to his lab, 30 liters of plasma were waiting for him on the counter, split between three insulated crates. 
The three goons that had brought them in watched him eagerly as he approached them with the vial that had been the product of months of painstaking research and testing. Chisaki broke down the glass vial and let the liquid inside pull in his palm. With his other hand, he reached into a crate. The plastic warped and the plasma sloshed around his hand. An acrid smell filled the air as the plasma took on a more congealed texture, matching the contents of his palm, then the liquid shifted as plastic membranes formed around them. Once Shisaki was done, all three of the crates had 30 bags of modified plasma between them. Get those into darts and start selling them, Shisaki said as he washed his hands three times. Today marks the first step in ridding the world of heroes. As much as all for one hated interacting with his protege, it had been too long since his last in-person visit, and the mentally twisted teenager was growing sullen. Shigaraki reminded him too much of his younger brother at times, gritty and so full of spite. Consciously, he took great joy in turning the legacy of one for all against itself, but in moments where Shigaraki skulked after just missing a high score, or awkwardly avoided his own minions, all for one could envision his own brother at his side, helping him like he was supposed to. The thought was a different kind of pain from the one that ravaged his broken body. At the back of the lab, all for one's personal doctor had set aside a few chairs and the television. Dr. Garaki himself peered out occasionally from behind his latest Nomu, catching glimpses of the hero students as he regulated the cork intake of his latest test subject. When all for one spared a glance back at the Nomu, he silently approved of the bony, bat-like wings sprouting from its back. Flight was always a useful ability in one's arsenal. All for one was beginning to regret his decision to leave the sports festival alone. It had been a terribly dull affair so far, a few tantalizing quirks, sure, but all of them so grossly mishandled. Perhaps he had a few centuries on them all, but that was no excuse to be so sloppy. It gave him no small amount of ironic amusement that a quickless kid showed exactly how pathetic this future batch of heroes was shaping up to be so far. I want that one, Shigaraki said, pointing at the screen. All for one feigned an interested grunt. Which one? The shadow one. It's like having an extra party member. Too difficult to control, all for one muttered. And I don't think fusing it with another quirk would help. Its utility is tied up in its sentience, removing that would leave it no better than any other emitter quirk. Shigaraki grunted and returned his attention to the screen. The final preliminary round had just ended, and the announcer promised live interviews after a commercial break. When are we going to see All Might's successor? The question left all for one vaguely uneasy. Thus far, he hadn't caught a glimmer of his age-old nemesis, the quirk he had so foolishly bequeathed to his rebellious younger brother. There were still the upperclassmen competing tomorrow, but logically, it made the most sense to pass the quirk on to someone younger, and give them time to acclimate to his power. Perhaps Yagi wouldn't behave logically, but Nezu almost certainly would. Had Yagi clung to his quirk, perhaps deluding himself that he could keep up his charade for a while longer? Or had Nezu taken the precaution of keeping one for all out of the tournament altogether? I don't believe we will be seeing it today, all for one said. I think they realize that unfriendly eyes would be watching. Shigaraki scowled, and for a moment, all for one caught a glimpse of white hair. We should have attacked it. Patience, Shigaraki. This is an excellent opportunity to gather information, and leaving this alone will invite them to lower their guard for future events. Next year, perhaps. All for one felt the tremors of approaching footsteps, a fourth set in the room. He let the sensation wash over him, the product of several quirks he had stolen and fused together to give himself a tactile base since few quirks could fool. By the time it reached him, he could sense the Nomu down to the extra arm spreading from its sides. In the beast's massive hands were a bucket of popcorn and two sodas. Thought I'd test the latest specimen, Garaki said. Did it pop the popcorn like I asked it to? Shigaraki crammed a handful in its mouth. Too much salt, he growled as he washed it down with soda. Noted, the doctor said. Did it at least butter the popcorn? Shigaraki nodded as he went for a second handful. Impressive work as ever, doctor. I'm glad to see this one has greater faculties than that first experiment. Melding an intelligence-enhancing quirk did more harm than good. The trick is to only use quirks similar enough in function to avoid overtaxing the brain. Of course, with a bit of all for one, I could bypass that problem entirely. All for one did not dignify that suggestion with a response. Instead, he turned his attention back to the interview, and the green-haired kid who told the world he was quirkless. The child had already come onto his radar, and something about the wording caught his interest, drawing attention to the extra toe and the diagnosis. He'd stolen enough quirks over the years to know that the quirk gene manifested regardless the number of joints in one's toes, and the child's words rang of half-truths and hidden secrets. Had Yogi found his successor after all? Shota sipped on a juice pack as he watched the spectators file back into their seats. Yamada smirked at him and said, still drinking those things? You think you'd grow out of them after you turn 10? With a dry stare, Shota said, these have enough caffeine to kill a mule. No way, really. Yamada swiped it and read the ingredients label. His eyebrows rose when he saw the caffeine content. How hasn't your heart exploded yet? If you ask any of my students, especially the ones I've expelled, they'd be happy to tell you I don't have one of those. 
Careful what you say, I think the mic is on. As Shota frantically fumbled for the off switch, only to find the mic had been off the whole time, his ashy howled with laughter. Get a hold of yourself, Aizawa said, it's almost time to start. Yamada wheezed. Just give me a sec. Haven't seen you look that startled since midnight let you have a look up her. Izashi, say another word and I will hang you from the rafters by your ankles. Will you at least, let me tuck my shirt in first this time. Shota muttered sourly under his breath and flicked the mic on. Afternoon everyone, I'm sure you're all eager for this to be over, so let's call out this year's top 8 students. Hey, what was that? Where was the showmanship? I'm not putting up with another minute of your showmanship, if I can help it. It's been a long enough day and I have patrols after this. Bakugo came out first, never mind that Izuku, the current top student, should have had that honor. The crowd exploded with cheers and applause, and the explosive teen drank in their adoration with visible smugness. Shota rubbed at his temples and wondered how much of a beating it would take to get that arrogance of his under control. As each student emerged, it was obvious which were the crowd favors, the flashy quirks, siblings of heroes, and the girls that put too much on display. While everyone else received a generally positive reception, Izuku's was far more mixed. There were those just as eager, if not more so, in their applause than before, poking out in places among a sea of apathetic claps and quiet murmurs. Most infuriating of all were the jeers and booing, nothing ostensible enough to pick out in the crowd, but enough to make itself known amidst the quiet, half-hearted cheers. Midnight bit back a scowl as she heard Midoriya's reception. I hear some people in the crowd in need of some punishment. Cracking her whip for emphasis, she added, with a voice as firm and cold as iron, and not the fun kind. That got the crowd to quiet down. Midnight passed her steely gaze over them before putting on a smile. The eight students here have gone through hell and back to make it this far, but only one will come out on top. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Once the crowd quieted down, Midnight said, before we get started, a quick reminder to our students and our viewers that, this year, support equipment with the school's approval is permitted in this festival. However, refills and recharging of equipment is strictly prohibited. What the students walk in with is what they get to use for the whole tournament. Any student found in violation of this rule will be disqualified. The crowd muttered, but Midnight spoke over them. Now, let's see which students will be paired against each other first. Boys, if you be so kind. Yamada turned on the mic and shouted, yeah. That's our cue. Fire up the randomizer, eraser head. But one hand rubbing at his stinging ears, Aizawa had a button on his phone. They came up with a list of pairings that appeared on every screen in the stadium. The first round will be Tailman and Deku. As soon as he heard his hero name, Mashirao straightened his shoulders and stretched. He found Izuku looking back at him and returned the smile. The other students filed back into the waiting rooms, while Izuku and Mashirao walked shoulder to shoulder onto the circular concrete arena. The rules are simple, Midnight said. Any student that lands out of bounds, exits the arena, falls unconscious, surrenders, or is immobilized loses the match. Intentional headshots will be penalized, and multiple infractions will get you disqualified. If we call for the fight to stop, you stop. Do you understand? Mashirao nodded with Izuku. Then stand on the white lines in the arena and wait for my mark. Izuku's stance was relaxed, loose, and non-threatening. Against his will, Mashirao found his own posture relaxing as well. He watched Izuku's arms carefully. Over the past school year, he had been able to win in direct hand-to-hand -hand combat, though those victories got harder as the year went on. With support gear thrown into the mix, Mashirao didn't like his chances. He has seen firsthand how well Izuku could move around with those wires, and even if the flat arena ground didn't offer the same amount of options, he didn't doubt that Izuku would find a creative way to outmaneuver him. Mashirao knew his best bet was to get in close, too close for those wires to come into play. He crouched, preparing himself for a sprint. Start. Izuku clasped his hands and bowed. Mashirao was so startled that he nearly fell over. As Izuku continued the gesture, Mashirao thought back to the times he and Izuku had gone back home after school, often at the start of the year. Maybe once a month after the year picked up and he started dating Ashido. Though most his fighting style came from Aizawa, it always made him smile to see Izuku use a thrower block that he had shown him. Mashirao straightened, clasped his hands, and returned the bow. They both stood together, and crouched into fighting stances, legs wide, arms raised, back straight. They approached carefully, their steps in unison, circling around as they came closer, each watching for an opening in the other's stance. Some confused muttering rose in the crowd, but present Mick excitedly shouted over the intercom, Is this what I think this is? Please tell me it is. Azawa's groan was audible over the intercom. Please don't fanboy over this. Izuku made the first move, a sudden kick that snapped towards Mashira's shoulder. Without thinking, he blocked it with his forearm. He felt metal bars beneath the dark green tracksuit, a reminder that this wasn't one of their dojo spars. Those boots could smash concrete, Mashirao had seen it with his own eyes. He needed to be more careful. As Izuku regained his footing, Mashirao jabbed forward. They traded blows. 
Arms slid and twisted around each other, legs and knees snapped up for more forceful blows, and fingers grasped for an opportunity to grapple and pin. Yes, yes, it is. Present Mick shouted joyfully. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in for some real-life kung fu action. Masharao blocked a jab with a wing block, only to find it a feint. Izuku's boot slammed into his gut. He reeled, arms raised, feet scrambling to keep him upright. Each breath was agony, but he pumped as much air into his lungs as he could stand. The crowd was a bubbling background murmur that bit into Mashiro's concentration. He longed for the smooth waxy texture of polished wood beneath his feet, the aroma of herbal teas and sweat permeating the air, the gentle light of the setting sun, as it streamed through the open windows. Casting the dojo in gold and auburn hues. The concrete beneath his feet felt too cold and rough, the air too charged with excitement, the light too harsh and direct. Mashiro ground his teeth and shook himself. This wasn't a spar, this was real combat. He had to win here, had to prove heroes were more than their flashy gear. Beating Izuku, who had only come, so far thanks to that gear, would be the perfect way to make that statement. And yet, Izuku wasn't using that gear. As the fight dragged on, it became all too obvious, that Izuku wasn't going to use any of it, not the whips, not the pouches at his belt, not the strength-enhancing braces on his legs. Though they both wore costumes and fought before a nationwide audience, Mashirao found himself reminded over and over of their after-school spores. He even found himself counting out the forms in his head, 1 to 2 to 5 block 4 to 6. Mashiro gasped as an uppercut ground into his stomach. Years of practice had him fall into a defensive stance as he gasped for breath. Dodge through 1 to 3 block. The incoming blow turned into a throw. Izuka pulled him up over his knee, dragging him off his feet. Mashiro whipped his tail, riding himself as he slipped out of Izuku's grasp. 4 to 7 dodge 4. His punch met empty air as Izuku sidestepped it. Izuku grabbed his wrist and yanked. His tail dragged on the ground as he fought for his balance. An arm came up just in time to deflect Izuku's follow-up kick. 8-3. The moment Mashirao slipped back into his training forms, Izuku darted through his guard and landed another punch. Blow after blow to his abdomen, was slowly depriving him of oxygen. Already, he felt light-headed and nauseous, as if he had run 5 miles on top of a mountain. As Izuku perfectly countered another form, Mashirao realized what was happening. Somehow, Midoriya knew his routine, knew exactly which form would follow the next, and knew exactly how to counter it. That explained how Izuku's blows seemed to find the precise spots he wasn't guarding. Mashirao backpedaled, and Izuku made no move to close the sudden distance. Mashirao took those few precious seconds to think. If he tried to attack again, Izuku would anticipate his forms and counter them. So, his only option was to let Izuku make the first move, react to it, and trust his training, and instincts to counterattack properly. Izuku may have given himself an advantage, by studying his form and fighting habits, but he couldn't win against reflexes honed by years of training. Emboldened by his plan, Mashirao inched forward. A tense silence filled the stadium as everyone waited for the fight to resume. Mashiro waited, arms raised, his eyes fixed on Izuku's feet for any hint of his next action. The slight shift of his left foot signaled a jab. Mashiro blocked and flowed seamlessly into his next form. Izuku's arms rose to divert the attack, and a foot leapt towards his face. Trusting his forms, Mashiro leaned back and flung up his own foot, using his tail to balance and strike higher. Izuku sidestepped, but Mashiro was back on his feet fast enough to block the next punch. Their fist fight dragged on for minutes. Mashirao scored a few blows as reflex, and practice gave him small openings in Izuku's eerily impregnable defense. Izuku connected some hits in return, when Mashirao got thrown off by Izuku's bizarre body language. As time dragged on, the earlier hits wore at Mashirao's stamina. Sweat wrenched his face, and each breath burned like a furnace. He had to fight the urge to double over and gasp in pain. The thought crossed his mind that he should yield and save his strength for later rounds, but he couldn't accept that he had lost to Izuku on even footing. Not like this. Evenly matched with four limbs to four, Mashirao had only his cork left to tip the balance. His tail, though less nimble than his father's, hit a lot harder. He whipped around, swiping his tail at Izuku's legs. When he turned back around, Mashirao found his opponent three feet in the air. Before he could react, a foot connected with his shoulder. The flying kick knocked him off the arena edge he hadn't even realized was there. And after a spectacular kung fu performance, the battle goes to Deku. Present Mick shouted to the audience. Absolutely unbelievable. Please tell me that's all recorded, I have to watch that again. You can worry about it after we get through the rest of this tournament. Now, if Tsukiyomi and Kreidi could come onto the stage, we will start the next round. Mashirao took Izuku's hand. He leaned heavily on his classmate's shoulder, his breathing still ragged and shallow from the beating his abdomen took as they went to recovery girl's office. She had them both sit down and check them over for broken bones. Nothing broken on either of you. Good. Keep it that way and I won't whack you over the head with my cane. She turned to Mashirao and said, I could help with those bruises, but it'll leave you tired. Mashirao knew that if he took that offer, he'd be finished. 
His arms felt heavy as it was, and if recovery girl sapped more of his strength to patch up his bruises, he didn't doubt that he'd fall asleep. No, I'll be fine. I can keep going. He let out a groan as he stood, but he gritted his teeth and walked off the pain. The recovery girl sighed and brought out a jar of white gummies. These have aspirin in them. Just take one. Mashao gratefully took the gummy. Within seconds, the pain receded, though he still couldn't take deep breaths without wincing. Good luck on the next round, Izuku said as he walked out the door. You too. As Mashara went to his waiting room, he found his father waiting in the hallways. Mashara straightened his back and walked briskly up to him. I, I'm sorry I lost, he said. I don't know how he did it. The elder Ojiro shook his head. You have nothing to be sorry for. You gave it your all, and that's all that matters. But, but I still lost. I know I'm stronger than him, and I'm faster than him. I've trained for years, and he's had months. Though he tried to hold them back, tears came to his eyes. So how? How did he beat me? His father sighed and patted his shoulder. You realized halfway through the match, that he was anticipating your moves, didn't you? I, I did. I had slipped into the training forms, and he took advantage of that. But even after I stopped, I still could barely get a hit on him. I don't get it. The problem is, you let him control the flow of the battle. You tried to react to him, to use your training, and reflexes to counterattack. He knew exactly how you would react to each situation, and had already planned his own counterattack in advance. He knew how you defend against that counter, and had his own defense ready. He had planned that fight 20 moves in advance, and led you down the path of your own defeat. Mashao stared at his father dumbstruck. How could he know all that? I don't know. I do know that he started blocking your blows before you moved to make them. He punched where there would be a gap in your stance, rather than where there was that gap. Then, if he knew everything I was going to do beforehand, how could I win against someone like that? His father grinned and said, you have two options. Either think as far ahead yourself, or do something no one could possibly anticipate. With those parting words, his father left, leaving Masher out to wonder how he was going to handle the rest of the finals, when he couldn't even win against a classmate without a quirk. Hitashi smirked at his opponent and said, so, ground zero, how does it feel to lose every round to a quirkless kid? Ha. Huh? Bakugo looked as though he was about to burst a blood vessel. What the what did you just say? Start. Present Mick shouted. For half a heartbeat, as the snarling, enraged face of Ground Zero rocketed at him, framed by the flash and smoke of twin nitroglycerin explosions, Hitashi felt a flicker of fear. He shouted, blast to your left. Unconsciously, Bakugo complied. He blasted his left gauntlet, flinging himself to the edge of the ring. As he got up, disoriented by the brainwash and slamming his own face into the cement, Shinso whipped his capture scarf, knocking him over to the side. Itashi wasn't sure how long that trick would hold up, but at least he had taken out the most annoying bunch of those entitled hero students. Yoyozu had expected to lose to Tokoyami. For all her quirks utility, there was little she could do in close quarters against the shadow entity. Even the flashbangs she had made, were only enough to stun Tokoyami's quirk for a few seconds, and the net she had made only trapped her opponent for the brief moment it took for Dark Shadow to slice through it. Faced with the option of expending more lipids for a losing battle, she instead chose to forfeit. The crowd clearly disapproved, but she knew she had to think of the long battle. Against Suzuku, Yuirozu felt she could win. He had proven eerily competent as the year progressed, but he was still quirkless. All she needed to do, was keep her distance and make a support item to bind him up. She had first scattered caltrips all over the field, but Izuku sprinted through them without any hesitation. The flashbangs came next. A wire lashed out to knock them into her field of vision as she looked away. As she stumbled around, blinded and hobbled by her own culturps, Midoriya kicked her in the stomach hard enough to drive the air out of her. A blind, weightless sensation gripped her, and for a moment, she couldn't breathe, as though she were deep under the ocean with the surface out of reach. She hit the ground. Her arm protested as it bent at an awkward angle under her. In ten seconds, Midoriya had beaten her. He had beaten her on every test, beaten her to the trust and confidence of their classmates, beaten her in handling the crisis they had faced in their first month, but up to this point. She had still believed that she could win in a straight fight against him, one on one, quirks at their disposal, nothing around to give either of them an advantage. That illusion shattered like glass. As Midori helped her off the field, she couldn't help but wonder how she had failed to measure up to him after everything she had done to be the best. The first battle had done nothing to convince Endeavor that Midori would live up to his promise. His CQC was impressive enough, but the battle had gone on for a long time, with both sides taking hits. The second round was equally unimpressive to the number 2 hero, though he had to give the kid credit for his insane reflexes and impeccable aim. The third battle left him worried. Though he saw the flaws in Tsukiyomi's quirk, Endeavor respected its power and flexibility. Even in its weaker state, it would easily outmaneuver and zone out Midoriya, making a ring out easy. For the first minute of the fight, Endeavor's assessment had proved correct. 
Midoriya tried whipping his wires around Dark Shadow, but the apparition darted in the path of each blow, leaving Midoriya without an opening, as Dark Shadow penned Midoriya closer and closer to the edge. He hadn't counted on Midoriya leaping 10 feet in the air, over a startled Dark Shadow, and using his grapples to pull himself on top of Tsukiyomi. Instead of going for the ring out, Midoriya raised a fist high and brought it down into his opponent's stomach. Dark Shadow wavered like a heat haze and vanished into Tsukiyomi's shadow. As Tsukiyomi rolled on the ground, Midnight hovering over him, and announced his defeat. With an astonishing turn of events, Deku went from teetering on the edge of defeat to a decisive finishing blow. The audience definitely had, yet to warm up to the quirkless student, judging by the faltering applause. On one hand, Endeavor saw the glaring flaws in Tsukiyomi's fighting style, relying far too much on his quirk and faring poorly in close quarters. On the other, it was impressive enough that Deku had overcome such a powerful quirk, despite his disadvantage. As he stood, he felt eyes turning towards him. He held out his hands in front of him, and as loudly as he could muster, even emphasizing each blow of his hands with puffs of flame, he clapped. Green eyes met his. The quirkless hero held his gaze without a flicker of emotion on his face, until he passed out of view with Tokoyami slung over his shoulder. As his son walked onto the field, Endeavor wondered if he would have to keep his end of the bargain after all. Achako had seen how the other fights against Deku had gone. She knew she wasn't as smart as Yoirosu, or as strong as Ojiro, or had a quirk as powerful as Tokoyami's, but she just had to touch him, and it would be over. She touched him. The moment it happened, she knew something didn't feel right, as though he had practically let it happen. She had her answer a second later as Izuku pulled himself back into bounds with his wires. Even when she cancelled his gravity, he twisted gracefully back onto his feet, ran up to her, and swept her legs out from under her with a single kick. One arm got pinned behind her back as she fell, and Izuku grabbed the other one before she could touch him. With both hands pinned and pressed flat against the ground, Achako had no choice but to admit defeat. As she dusted herself off and shook Izuku's hand, Achako felt her resolve strengthen. After all, if Deku could win against everyone, she could do it too. She just had to get stronger. Hitashi knew that the jig was up. Tailman had picked up on his quirk's limitations by the third round, and Kraidi had likewise seen through his taunts. Now, he was up against the student who had figured him out before the second preliminary round had even started. I don't suppose you let my quirk affect you. Would you really want to win that way? Hitashi blinked. He could feel the connection in the back of his mind. Deku had answered him, and if he willed it, he could make him walk over the edge. Instead, he laughed, because Deku was right. He could win with a single command, but what would be the point? He had already shown them all how amazing his quirk could be, had already taken down one of 1A's most powerful students, what would using his quirk on a quirkless student prove? That he would take the easy way out. Itachi let the capture scarf unfurl around him. Let's do this. Deku let out 12 feet of wire from each hand. Back at you. Wow, will you look at this? Present Mick. Both of them look fired up. They had a spectacular performance back in the hostage rescue, now let's see how they fare against each other. Begin. From the moment Hitashi felt the first whip crack against his fingers, making his hold on his scarf slip, he knew he was outclassed. No matter how he wove the thick, durable fabric through the air, Deku's whips wound their way through like homing missiles, sometimes even wrapping around his own scarf, to strike from different angles. Step by step, Hitashi was forced back until he felt his back heel slide off the edge. As a last resort, he sent the entire bulk of the fabric at Deku, helping to wrap him in a tightly wound prison, only for his scarf to close around thin air. He barely had time to look up as Deku's shadow loomed over him. The kick to his shoulders knocked him back. Before Shinso hit the ground, Deku's wires caught him by the shoulders, softening his landing. See you in the hero course, Deku said as they shook hands. The way he said it, as though it was already a done deal, felt far sweeter than any victory he had so far that day. Though there was barely any applause for the two of them, Shinso walked out of that arena standing tall and with a smile on his face. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe, and comment down below, and turn on that bell notification, and also check out the other videos that I have created, and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.